Alrighty, so the topic of longevity, and this is one of my favorite topics. The way that I'm going to break down this video is I'm going to go through several different organ systems and break down each one. And with each organ system, I'll be reviewing what I think will give you the most benefit. I'll be discussing the physiological changes we see in some of these organ systems, the physical manifestations as it relates to aging of some of these organ systems over time. And most importantly, I'll be discussing what you can do to help stave off a decline in the functioning ability of these organ systems. Or to put another way, to help you hopefully to live longer. And the second half of the video will be dedicated to the topics of diet and exercise. Along the way, I'll be referencing a couple of clinical studies and I'll be leaving a link in the description down below for those of you who are interested. So the goal of this video is to give you some tools to help increase your lifespan. But not just that, it's to make it a more productive, a fruitful last 20, 25 years of your life. So that you are independent, you have vim, you have vigor, you're not always in and out of the hospital. And it's an end of life that is filled with vitality. I don't know about you, but I don't want my last 20 years to be miserable, filled with pain, always battling your chronic medical illnesses. I don't want to be isolated, living alone, not having anything to do, nothing pressing, nobody counting on me for anything. I want my last 20 years to be productive and happy years. So physiological changes. What is it that happens when we age? A lot of bad stuff. Nothing, not a single thing gets better physiologically with age. Let's start off with the cardiovascular system. This is definitely important because this is the leading cause of death from a cardiovascular source. So what we're trying to do is apply the brakes. We're trying to forestall some of the potentially deadly effects of a failing cardiovascular system. We don't want coronary artery disease. We don't want to have a heart attack. We don't want to have a stroke. We don't want to end up with congestive heart failure. Studies have shown that at autopsy, elderly patients, especially those in their sixth decade of life, about 75% of these patients have a fair amount of coronary artery disease. Now, this is at autopsy. The majority of major risk factors for cardiovascular disease are modifiable with what's called TLC or therapeutic lifestyle changes. These risk factors are smoking, obesity, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes. The introduction of a healthy diet, an adequate exercise regimen, and tobacco cessation for smokers can help to better control, if not completely control, these risk factors. Now, in the event that some of these risk factors are not completely controlled, you might try adjunctive drug therapy that does have proven benefit, obviously. This might include blood pressure medication if you can't reach your target goal, or a statin for improved cholesterol control. Or you might need medication to more tightly control your blood sugar. And this is when sitting down with your physician and discussing the best tack to take to control these risk factors would be the best approach. Okay, so let's talk about the lungs. So the pulmonary system. The capacity of the lungs as we age also worsens. What happens is that our vital capacity, which is the maximum amount of air that your lungs can hold, this diminishes over time. Additionally, your FEV1 decreases. This is the, this is the amount of air that you can expel with a maximal forceful exhalation in one second. This is a key metric that's used in interpreting pulmonary function tests. This helps pulmonologists diagnose certain lung diseases like COPD. Now, interestingly, the changes that occur with our breathing as we age aren't accounted for by the lungs completely. The diaphragm can weaken as we age, making it more difficult to inhale and exhale, especially when we exercise. The rib cage bones, these actually become thinner and they change shape. And this makes uh, them less able to expand and contract with breathing. Nerves in our airway that trigger coughing, these become less sensitive to foreign particles. And when these particles build up, they can damage the lungs. 
Also, as we age, our immune system may weaken, which can leave us more susceptible to infections like influenza and also pneumonia. So what measures can we take to help protect our lungs? The biggest, obviously, is not to smoke. We can also try to avoid air pollution and also secondhand smoke. Uh, we can also avoid chemicals in our home, uh, which can cause respiratory issues. We can also exercise, which keeps our chest muscles strong. We can also keep our weight under control. Uh, it's been shown that abdominal fat can impede the diaphragm's ability to fully expand the lungs. And one more thing is we can refrain from not lying in bed too long. This can allow phlegm to settle in your lungs, which can harm your lung capacity. Okay, so now let's move on to the musculoskeletal system. So as we age, these years, they have a ravaging effect on the musculoskeletal system. This is how you can tell that someone is old, right? They're hunched over. They've got what's called a dowager's hump. They have a marked decrease in muscle mass. They've got osteopenia. They've got osteoporosis. They've got compression fractures. Now, obviously, you can't see these, but you can see the results of these. They may have been six foot five in the past, and now they're five foot five. So the formation of bone, it's the interplay between osteoclasts, osteoblasts, hormones, cytokines, and also growth factors. There are a number of factors at play here. And as we get older, what usually happens is that our weight-bearing activity usually decreases, and this leads to a negative calcium balance. What we can do is to be mindful of engaging in weight-bearing activities to increase the stress on our bones, causing our bones to adapt which delays any onset of osteopenia or osteoporosis. The best case scenario would be if you had worked out in your late teens, early 20s, as far as weight-bearing exercise goes, so that you could have built up a sufficient amount of bone mineral density, which ideally would sustain you for most of, if not all of your life. Now, if this isn't the case, if you did not engage in weight-bearing exercises, it's not too late you can still implement weight-bearing exercises, and you will derive benefit from this. The take-home point here is that poor musculoskeletal health increases the risk of mortality independent of age. So that statement right there, that should tell you just how imperative it is to maintain a healthy musculoskeletal system. Not just longevity, but a productive, healthy, vigorous end of life. And when we are talking about a healthy musculoskeletal system, this is mainly driven by an adequate bone mineral density as measured on a DEXA scan. The loss of what's called appendicular muscle, which originates on the bones that, that make up the body's limbs, that loss is not linear. It does accelerate with age. There is a medical condition that all of you have seen but may not know what the medical term is, and that is sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is a loss of muscle mass, which is usually age-related. Specifically, it's a loss of muscle mass, which is at least two standard deviations below the mean for a normal person. This also is an independent risk factor for mortality. Sarcopenia is found in over 50% of patients who are at least 80 years of age. It's very prevalent. It's not just an independent risk factor for mortality. It's an independent risk factor for morbidity. So with regards to neurological changes, anatomically, the brain does shrink after about age 60 or so. Now, most of this shrinkage is seen in the white matter. It's also seen in the frontal and temporal lobes mostly. There is also a decrease in cerebral blood flow or blood flow in the brain which is heterogeneous and it's calculated to be between 5 and 15 percent. What we see is that certain memory performances on cognitive testing, such as those for procedural memory, such as knowing how to type or ride a bike, primary memory, which refers to short-term memory, and semantic memory, which is a form of long-term memory. An example of this would be remembering that Austin is the capital of Texas. These do stay relatively intact as we age. Now, on the flip side, we see that executive functioning and examples of this would be or include organization, planning, prioritizing, 
Episodic memory examples of this would include where you parked your car this morning or remembering what you had for dinner with a friend last week. And lastly, working memory examples of this would include remembering a telephone number or remembering a set of instructions or directions that someone gave you. These three are the specific domains which are negatively affected by aging. Now, executive functioning, this is critical for the engagement of purposeful, self-preserving, and independent behavior. Without this, the patient is not capable of taking care of himself or herself. Poor diet is a leading cause of mortality in the United States. It outpaces cardiovascular disease, tobacco use, and obesity. When discussing one's diet, it's an incomplete discussion if you don't talk about dietary patterns and its importance on health outcomes. Dietary patterns are defined as the quantities, proportions, variety, or combination of different foods, drinks, and nutrients and diets, and the frequency with, with which they are habitually consumed. 2021, JAMA, which is the Journal of the American Medical Association, published results of a large study which concluded that evidence showed that dietary patterns that involve consumption of vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, whole grains, unsaturated vegetable oils, fish, and lean meat were associated with a decreased risk of all-cause mortality. It reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and cancer. What more could you ask for? Additionally, these healthy patterns, they were relatively low in red and processed meat, high-fat dairy, and refined carbohydrates or sweets. Now, I'm not going to delve into the specific quantity recommendations of the dietary components, the fruits, the vegetables, whole grains, etc., I think that would be better suited for a dedicated video on the topic of diet. But I will leave a link down below which does spell out what these recommendations are. So this dietary pattern is consistent with that that's generally recommended by the World Health Organization, the World Cancer Research Fund slash American Institute for Cancer Research, and the American Cancer Society. And to give you some examples of different dietary patterns which are recommended, a few examples would include the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, plant-based and vegetarian diets, low-fat diets, and also low-cholesterol diets. Now, any discussion related to a healthy diet also needs to emphasize the importance of energy balance over time. Overnutrition, which leads to being overweight or obese, is the single most important dietary factor associated with poor health outcomes. Several years ago, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, they published results of a very large prospective study which evaluated the correlation between overweight, obesity, and mortality. Not surprisingly, they concluded excess body weight during midlife, including overweight, is associated with an increased risk of death. Exercise. Ideally, an exercise program should include exercises that improve aerobic fitness, strength, and mobility. Strength exercises. Strength exercises provide important health benefits beyond aerobic activity. Also referred to as resistance training, strength training can be performed using body weight resistance, such as push-ups, free weights, such as barbell squats, or other tools such as machines and resistance bands that place loads on muscles, forcing them to work harder. The best programs emphasize multi-joint exercises such as squats, deadlifts, and presses that involve all major muscle groups and working them through a full functional range of motion. Strength training is typically done two to three days per week. Now, there is something called the Stress Recovery Adaption Model, and this provides a useful conceptual framework for the development of training programs. In this model, a training stress, say from squats or deadlifts, is imposed on the person lifting. This person then recovers from and adapts to the stress. There is a physiological change which occurs within the motor units of the muscle 
And this adaptation leads to an increase in muscle mass and more importantly, an increase in strength. And this increase in strength can confer numerous benefits on your overall health. Some of these benefits include obviously increased strength and power. There's also an improvement on your body composition. You get a reduction of visceral fat and an increase in lean muscle mass and also bone density. There is an increased anaerobic capacity, an increase in insulin sensitivity, and you also see improvement of risk factors for cardiovascular disease. You can see just how important strength training is. The upshot is that there is a large and growing evidence base which shows a strong correlation between physical strength and a reduction in all-cause mortality across the lifespan. The 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines recommends the equivalent of 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous aerobic activity. So the key is to determine what is moderate to vigorous aerobic activity. One way to approach this is by using what is called METS, which stands for metabolic equivalence. This is basically a measure of the amount of energy that your body expends for any given activity. For instance, one MET is the energy that your body spends sitting at rest. So an activity with a MET value of, say, four, means that you're exerting four times the energy than you would if you were sitting still. Now, there are age stratified charts detailing the recommended fitness goal in METs for your age group. And these charts also suggest the training intensity in METs to achieve your fitness goal. For example, I'm in my 50s and my fitness goal is greater than 10 METs. And what is recommended to achieve this goal is a training intensity that falls between 7 and 8.5 METs. And there are charts that are available online, which give you the amount of METs expended for numerous different activities. So in my particular case, playing a game of touch football or cycling 10 miles per hour would fall into the recommended range of 7 to 8.5 METs. And again, remember the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines recommended 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity per week. And for those of you who are interested, I will leave a link to these charts down below. And what are the benefits of aerobic training? As you might expect, there are a myriad of beneficial effects. Aerobic training induces beneficial effects on lipoproteins. What you get is a decrease in your very low density lipoproteins and also an increase in your HDL, your good cholesterol. There is an improvement in your body composition and there's an improvement in your aerobic capacity. Long-term aerobic exercise has a beneficial effect on your blood pressure. So aerobic exercise may improve insulin sensitivity and may prevent the development of type 2 diabetes in high-risk groups. There was a large retrospective study which analyzed the physical activity habits of over 10,000 Harvard alumni over a 12-year span. What was found is that males who engaged in moderately vigorous sports activity they had a 23% lower risk of death than those who were less active. Also, large observational studies suggest that regular exercise reduces the risk of all-cause mortality. In conclusion, as you can see, living to an advanced age but still keeping a high quality of life can be challenging, but it can be done, especially if you're armed with the knowledge of what it takes to get there, knowing what potential obstacles maybe standing in your way, and knowing how to best navigate around those. So from me to you, good luck on your journey.